Thank you, Holly. I don't know what the opposite of keynote is, but that is me, the endnote, footnote, postscript, hopefully not afterthought. But if I can entice you with a reason to maintain at least a little bit of attention, I can promise you this. I'm not going to make you think. I'm not going to make you think. There'll be no number. I don't think there'll be any numbers on any of these. Uh, but I do want you all to feel something, and that is an extreme sense of pride in this really important work that we all do. Now, for those that know me well, it should come as no surprise that I have vast libraries of really great photo and video content that I've compiled over the years. Some of my own and some from others. And so I'm going to share some of the most interesting, beautiful, funny, and inspiring things I've seen over the years. And if you don't see yourself represented really directly in any of the content that was not an intentional oversight on my part. This is the footage I had and the amount of time I had to work with. But just know that everybody in here contributes to the, to the good stuff. OK, now just to get you warmed up, I want you to imagine my excitement when around a year ago, I found this magical folder on the file server with a treasure trove of really old district photos, like ones from old school actual slides, like the real ones, not PowerPoint slides. Stuff from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Stuff like this one. Photos like this one. And I don't know who those, those guys are. I don't know what they're doing, but it looks amazing. I thought that was a survey rod. It turns out it's a walking stick. And he looks like Gandalf the Wizard from Lord of the Rings. Uh, and sorry to change the pop culture reference so late in the day on you, but it just the analogy just works a little better. Uh, and then here's, a, here's another angle. Uh, and is it wrong that part of me wants to build a project that way? You know, let's get some excavators and some rocks and let's just go make some jazz. Let's do this. Uh, but, but really, oh, and here I made a meme out of it too. There you go. Uh, and, and pointing, but seriously, pointing and digging may look like fun. It, it does look fun. Uh, but that has gone by the wayside because we wouldn't build very interesting, interesting projects. I, I don't think we would incorporate the five elements. I mean, one, if we're lucky, this would not be a unicorn. I don't think they got a unicorn out of this, Mary. She's shaking her head. No way they got a unicorn out of that. Okay, but I'll have more of these oldies but goodies later on. Uh, the, the idea for this presentation came to me a few years ago when I watched uh, a presentation at the South Platte Forum by a fellow named Michael Forsberg. Now, he, Michael is a photographer for the, for the University of Nebraska, and they have this endeavor called the Platte Basin Time Lapse. And basically, they look at the entire watershed from Wyoming to Colorado to the Missouri River in Nebraska. And in short, this is like National Geographic quality footage that they've captured over the course of years. Their aim is to use imagery and storytelling to depict a watershed in motion. That's straight from their website. Dynamic, beautiful. It's good stuff, you should definitely check it out. But the way he spoke about what the river and the watershed meant to him was so inspiring. The footage was so beautiful. And he spoke of waiting for hours in a blind, in a cornfield just waiting for the sandhill cranes to arrive. And then all of a sudden being surrounded and feeling like he was in the loudest cocktail party ever. And the, the footage of all the life, the fish, the bugs, the plants, uh, game cameras capturing muskrats and beavers. Uh, those two look like they're in love. Uh, and ducks and Dear, it was just the coolest thing. But my favorite part had to be the time-lapse footage. They've set these cameras up and then let them capture footage for years looking at the same vantage point. And that's how they created this gorgeous mosaic uh, by stitching together images from the different seasons. That's all 12 months represented there. <clears throat> but when I saw him talk, he was sharing footage and he spoke about the water going up and down and how it's reminiscent of the way blood pulses through our bodies with each heartbeat. Uh, he spoke about the fluctuations, the seasonal, seasonal fluctuations in the ve vegetation in our riparian areas and the daily river dynamics they were able to observe by having a camera pointed at this same spot day after day for years fluvial geomorphology right before our eyes. And, and make no mistake, we all in here, we contribute to this story. This water started right here with us. 
Now, I don't have quite as fancy a footage as this, but it, of the, as this, but it inspired me to share some of the footage I've collected over the years in our industry. <clears throat> so as you watch this short piece, I filmed along the South Platte River one morning near Reynolds Landing in Littleton. This is near the Breckenridge Brewery. I'd like you to ponder how privileged we all are in that we get to be the caretakers of nature in the city. But for the practice of preserving open waterways, preparing them, restoring them to withstand all the sheer urbanity surrounding them, this sort of thing wouldn't exist. You know, getting to go along a nature walk like this five minutes from my house is an absolute treasure. You get a sense of calm and peace, and it is serene and beautiful, and it's so very alive, even in the middle of winter. And as you're walking along, the cold is invigorating in just the right way, and I didn't need to pay for a lift ticket to experience this. It was right there in the city. And as the river points at the downtown skyline, it's, it's no surprise that the water determined where the city originally settled. And how cool is it that we get to work where the water is? A special privilege in the West. We get to work where the water is. Ah, but achieving these outcomes involves some sweat and some mud, so let's look at some footage from the field. Now, I really enjoy the show Dirty Jobs. They highlight how there is such a beautiful dignity to people working with their hands, uh, like this fellow I filmed here. Now, what is he doing, and why is he on his back? Well, we built a box culvert that unfortunately had to be only three feet tall. Uh, more on that in a second. But building a structure uh, this short means someone gets the dirty job of removing forms by crawling through the structure on their back. Good times. But I am, I am grateful that somebody's willing to do this work. But why did it only need, need to be only three feet tall? Well, we were crossing under a petroleum gas line that could not be moved. So a quick PSA about potholing. If you're going to have a culvert that's 40 feet wide, make sure and pothole utilities at more than one spot. We just had one. And failed to appreciate the slope on said pipes, and we were forced to adjust a few of the cells on the end to fit them under said petroleum line. It was a good time figuring out that design change. Okay, but our maintenance contractors, they get into some dirty work too. Oh, the old shopping cart in the river trick again, is it? If there is one thing in this world I have very little patience for, it is shopping carts ending up in the wrong place. And I was a grocery store clerk for a brief time as a teenager, and perhaps that plays into my distaste for shopping carts in the wrong place, because I too had that job once in parking lots. But, uh, but there's a saying, if you see a turtle on top of a fence post, that it didn't get there on its own. And same thing for shopping carts in the waterway. It didn't get there on its own. Uh, but somebody gets the job of fishing that out, and this fellow is making it look a heck of a lot easier than it probably is to fish that, drag that thing across the river and up and out. And I'm very grateful for the people that do this work. But sometimes, engineers, we get dirty too, like in this gem. That's our own Bao Chung Tua with a former intern named Adam. And it would be hard to convince me that anybody is more passionate about our waterways than Bao. She just gets right in there, you know? She just goes for it. Uh, but Adam, um, he just doesn't look quite as into it. I, he might have been having a good time, but he, his face doesn't look like he's having a good time. And I don't know if it was this particular moment that was to blame, but I, I will say that he went into finance rather than engineering. If you look at his LinkedIn profile, it says finance, finance, finance. He wants to be your financial planner. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if Amelia's still here, but perhaps this should be part of the interview process for future interns. You know, stick them in some waiters. Just see, see how they do. See how they do. OK. Uh, and I also, uh, I sometimes joke. I sometimes joke that my job is to keep floods outdoors. Keep floods outdoors. That's what we do. Because when floods go indoors, that's when we have problems. Uh, and this is the Schuler family in the Four Mile Canyon Creek area in Boulder. And it was so striking to drive around Boulder in the aftermath of the 2013 flood seeing all these serve pro trucks lined up at every house, everyone's wet belongings out on their front yard like, like a neighborhood garage sale gone wrong. Uh, and in the past year, I've personally had water damage at my house, at the district office, 
yeah, the flood district got flooded. It's just it's another story. Uh, and then also my wife's office. And, and water damage, even just from plumbing, is traumatic, let alone what these folks went through. And there have been some epic floods around the world recently. Like, it seems to get worse. Either we've got more smartphones collecting footage of them, or, they, or they're getting worse, or both. Uh, like this one in Germany. And that's not a boat, that's a bucket for pipe bedding, a metal bucket for pipe bedding. And then the aftermath. Um, cars piled up in Belgium. More in China. And we got this poor Prius in Arizona. Oh and we got a flooded underpass in the UK. They, they probably need to close that road. Um, that might be good instead of watching. Uh, about 12 inches of water knocking over a semi-truck in Texas. It's always the big rigs think they can make it. Uh, a ped bridge, take, uh, debris taken out of ped bridge in Turkey. And then uh, the flood gets worse and worse. That's pretty epic. And then uh, dumpsters apparently float. Let's go. Uh, the most recent flood fatality we've had in the district happened in Inglewood in a basement like this. Nobody, everybody survived that one here. Uh, flash flood in Australia a few months back. And then uh, this is the most apocalyptic one I've come across. It's a, it's a house on fire in the river and then it hits a bridge. Dad, watch out! Is Mark Schutte still here? West Virginia, Mark Schutte. West Virginia. That's a bad day. I don't mean to make jokes. That is a very bad day. Uh, but so when we've done our jobs, when we've done our jobs, the floods stay outdoors and they become something of a spectator event. There are no rescues, maybe not even any news cameras. It's just infrastructure doing its job and it becomes a spectacle for people to watch. And it's why I love this photo so much because it's almost like she was out for a stroll and just happened to walk by a flood and just stopped to take a look. And there's the Gilbert White flood memorial next to her. It's got flood markers on it. So it's very, sim a lot of symbolism going on there, the raincoat and everything. Uh, but last summer, you heard uh, Nicole and Amy earlier, and I still feel bad about their PowerPoint uh, freezing up. That, that pained me. But uh, I was able to film. I had this Jim Cantori moment. I was able to film during that minor flood on Big Dry Creek. And I filmed uh, the progression of the flood. I stayed out there for a couple hours because I knew more flow was coming. But I filmed the progression of the flood at this particular low flow crossing. And here you can see it's starting to almost nearly overtopping. Here's a piece of debris coming in and smacking against the structure. Uh, then it's starting, just starting to overtop. And then this, uh, this kind of horrified me as a dad and his daughter playing on the hand railing. And when I said, I'm a flood control engineer and you should get off that. They uh, kind of stared blankly back at me and kept, kept on at it. And then now here it's uh, fully overtopping. And then here's where it, it flows into that, the project that Amy and Nicole spoke about earlier. And this is a glimpse of it uh, the very next day. So there was actually nothing to repair here except for some crusher finds where the flow got, it got past the paved area. Uh, so crusher finds do not survive riverine flow very well. So just keep that in mind. At this same site, further downstream, there was another low flow crossing that I filmed. And notice how much debris is caught up on the railings, how much higher the water is on the left than on the right. And this is why we model railings as obstructed. And if we have to model railings as obstructed, this next photo I took at the same site shows you why perhaps we should put a denser railing on there. Um, I'm glad mom is holding on, I'll just say that. And it's on the edge of a busy trail. Okay, and I know we sometimes have streams next to roads like McIntyre Gulch in this case. And, and we usually up in these, end up in these conversations about do we need a guardrail, do we not need a guardrail? And while this is a spot where they needed a guardrail, uh, and uh, my tailbone hurts just looking at that photo. Um, but, but cars and streams, they're not the best mix. And in a, in a car, it's still the most likely place for a person to die in a flood in the US. Uh, and I share this clip because it's just cool. They stuck a, a vehicle, an SUV, in a flume and filled it up with water to see when it would float. And it's pretty much when it gets to the top of the wheel wells, it starts floating. But, you know, that, that semi-truck in Texas with flowing water, it was like less than 12 inches, most likely. And you can see he's just the grad student, probably. They, they threw him in there, the grad student. Threw him in there to see if he could push it around. 
Okay, water quality. Let's talk about that briefly. It never ceases to amaze me how gross paved areas can get. I walked by this, I was walking out to my car in the district, at the district one day, and I came upon this, this, this white milky ooze that just seemed to be coming from nowhere, straight up out of the pavement, like there was some sort of store of something under the pavement just waiting to get out, and there it was, and I did not bother following it because I really just didn't want to know, but it was really gross. Uh, but I recently read about this really cool thing, and it's called, sorry, I'm going to use one technical term, but just, you, you got it. We can, we can do this, people. Um, and it's called phylogenetic diversity. Phylogenetic diversity. And what it means is it's a measure of how closely or far apart two organisms are on the tree of life. How close they are, how far apart. And by far the greatest phylogenetic diversity on the planet per unit area happens in areas of fresh water. That's the, work, that's the place we get to work which is really cool, but, but not really when the, the water looks like this. It looks like that crawdad's pretty happy, but hopefully it finds some food, and, and I don't see any other life besides the crawdad, so not much diversity there. That doesn't really promote the diversity. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know if Jess Clark is still here. He coined the term urban drool. I, I think he's the first person I heard say that. Uh, I like to call this uh, a gutter pan scale flash flood. I should have added like screaming sounds or something like it's coming right for you. Um, but, but of course this is lawn irrigation return flow. And, and even on a sunny day, all this bluegrass, it is amazing how much runoff that produces. And it all runs downstream to the creek and just eats away at the bed and banks day after day. I, I would call this heavy drool. This is heavy drool. That's, that's not just drool. Uh, and I keep a library of interesting artifacts we've come across along our waterways. Lots and lots of shopping carts, satellite dishes, satellite dishes, fire extinguishers. Uh, the front end of a semi truck came upon one of those once. Maybe it was that leftover of that Texas, that truck in Texas. I don't, I don't know. Maybe uh, more shopping carts. Uh, big wheels, found the big wheels. I like to think I'm a big pop culture reference guy. I like to think they were recreating the drag race scene from Greece in the LA River. But all the young people in here, you guys probably don't get that pop culture reference. That's so sad. Uh, let's see, what else we got? We got couches, we got mattresses. Couches, mattresses. Um, is this, I don't know if that's underwear. Let's just say, I hope it's not underwear. Uh, little liquor bottles, little liquor bottles. I came upon this one and I kept thinking, I missed a party somewhere, because this, this was, somebody had some fun, but they should have probably thrown those in the proper receptacle. That would have been nice. But, but folks, this is such an important part of our job because this chunk is everywhere. So we should really pursue every ounce of water quality treatment that we can get. Because when there's great water quality, it is really amazing how beautiful it can be. And the way the light shines on the water just right makes it almost look like fireworks. I always enjoy that. And the, and the wildlife it attracts. And the recreation it facilitates. And, and I, the geology, you know, the, the rocks tumbling into the creek and, and just working their way downstream, getting rounded out. It is, just, it is just the neatest thing. Okay, let's talk about failure. Let's talk about failure. We've heard a little bit about that today. I have come across my share of it. Uh, and this clip on Brantner Gulch shows the single largest head cut I've ever come across personally. It, it had cut down to bedrock. And, but then over time, the bedrock had started even to get cut into. And as you see, the head cut migrating upstream over the course of several years, we're just hoping it doesn't cause that, that drop structure to fail. And this is one where there's a development project that that's plans to improve this creek, but it started and stopped over the last 20 years. And hopefully that happens before the drop structure falls in. Uh, and you see, you see and hear a lot from us about high function and low maintenance. Low maintenance. So when we talk about low maintenance, it's because really confined streams with big drop structures are often really high maintenance. And the larger the drop structure, the riskier it can be and the greater the consequences of failure. This structure on Sand Creek, it's 20 feet tall, 20 foot tall drop, 40,000 square feet. Look at the size of it compared to those semis. And with such a big footprint, there's so many underground forces working away at that structure, trying to break it apart. And so when I zoom in on where those arrows are pointing, uh, you can see that there's a gap under the boulders. That, that is not a design feature, that's a bug, that's not good. And so this structure uh, is gonna eventually need to be replaced, and, and I would put it at least a million bucks just to replace it in kind, let alone if we 
take the opportunity to make it better, uh, but this structure is only 20, not even 20 years old, not even 20 years old. So the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, and it is, it is uh, amazing how expansive uh, the gaps under failed drop structures can be. You can go spelunking in them. I, I wouldn't recommend that, but Jake felt like going for it. Uh, this next clip shows a pothole we cored through the grout of a drop structure that was undermined. And you'll be able to see how much water, I mean, just basically the whole creek's running under the structure, which you can see there. So it's no wonder that a whole sinkhole can form underneath them. And then this one, uh, another one of those structures that they built without a cutoff wall, and this one was, was a, a concrete structure, so it stayed intact, but the whole thing flipped over. So that's actually the backside you're seeing, the thing, the water actually completely flipped the thing over. So we spend a lot of money fixing drop structures, and that plays into some of our thinking. Okay, community values. Let's talk about people. There are around three million people living in our district. We are in a city, so we can't, and you've heard a lot about this today, we can't be ignorant about humanity in our, in our work. And I know this footage shows a whole bunch of cars, but it's mostly because the lights are pretty, the lights are pretty. But I've, I've heard it said that you can gauge the vitality of a place by how many people you see out and about, not in cars, but walking, biking, running, kayaking. So community values, they need to be handled with intention because even in a walled section, like this one on Wonderland Creek, there's trails up on top of either side of those walls that are like eight feet tall. You'll still see signs of people getting down into the waterway and interacting with it. Uh, and, it's, and it's cool to see the crazy amount of activity that the existence of a bridge can generate. These are a series of, of hyperlapse videos uh, showing all the people crossing bridges that we get to build. And, and think about how much more the places on either side of these bridges thrive because the bridges exist. It is just the neatest thing to see. And these are just like five minute long videos. I don't even know what the, the trail counts would be, but very active. And then as we fly along our waterways, the, the activity and recreation a healthy waterway affords is really priceless because there are no tolls on these, there are no entrance fees, they belong to everyone and no one. Uh, this one's on a summer day on Clear Creek and Golden, and then these, these next two, these were taken in the middle of winter uh, in November, and you can see even in the middle of winter how many people are out and about along the trails. Okay, but one of the coolest things I've come across recently, and I think Jim Watt, he, he said my name enough times, I gotta say Jim's name. Jim uh, referred me to these, and they're these, uh, Strava, is, Strava is this app that lets you track your physical activity, and Strava actually aggregates everybody's activity onto these heat maps. And so the heat maps, the hotter the line, the more activity it represents, and so it's no surprise that most of the, the, the hotter lines are along the creeks, in this case, Westerly Creek and Sand Creek. And this is a bird's eye view of some of the more frequent trails. But when we pan south on this, on Westerly Creek, it's interesting to note that the heat kind of stops. It just goes dead right there. And the reason for that is because the creek goes into an underground box culvert right there for several blocks. So no more activity, no more, no more heat map. Uh, so decisions to underground a stream, they still come up today. And these decisions tend to be really difficult to undo or change later, and they have a fairly permanent impact on the extent to which you see people out and about. So, and I put it another way, piping a stream measurably diminishes the vitality of a place, let alone how much less effective pipes are as infrastructure than open channels. And sadly, these heat maps also show where there are not many people outside moving around. And as I zoom in on this particular area, you can see how dark it stays, and it's like a recreation desert. And I think there was a pretty distinct overlap with some of the red line districts that Mary showed earlier. And in this type of neighborhood, this is the sort of pedestrian experience people have. And so it's beyond just an issue of outdoor opportunities. It's not just recreation. This is like life and death, because that looks dangerous. I mean, they're walking with their little kiddos. It makes me sad. Uh, so it's like a visual depiction of some of the equity issues that you hear brought up. Okay, so the last video clip I'm gonna share it with you is by far the most watched and liked video clip I've ever shared to social media. And what makes it so powerful is that all this imagery was filmed on the same creek 
on the same day within a one mile stretch of Little Dry Creek in Westminster. It's showing the various vintage projects that were built along this waterway. And the contrast represents learning, progress, advancing the practice. This might be one of the most heavily invested in waterways in the district. And it's easy to judge those old concrete line channels to sort of scoff at them. Uh, but those old features, you know, they were built for a purpose to, to keep the community safer from floods because people got flooded. Uh, this is back to some of those old scanned photos I found uh, showing the aftermath of a flood in 1981. And here's a great contrast to show how undersized the old channel was and perhaps why the concrete line channel got built. And I believe, is Scott Tucker still here? Raise your hand. I think that's you in the picture. Okay, I don't know if he's still here or not, but I think that's him in the picture. And I'm sure he's standing there thinking like, the concrete worked and that didn't. Um, and, and so, thankfully, but thankfully we've evolved from that design approach. We kept learning and in fact, we've tried to influence land use decisions so mitigation projects like this aren't needed to begin with because the root of the problem in that picture is not the creek. What is the problem in the picture? It's, it's the buildings. The buildings got built too close. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna wrap up here uh, and, and say that this flood has an interesting Star Wars tie-in. I don't know, I don't remember seeing if Clint Henke from ERO was here or not, um, but Clint lived in this neighborhood as a kid and he lived he lived here as a little first grader. And, and so imagine the trauma he felt as a little first grader having his, his home flood. It's just awful. And when he told me about this, he said he still had one of his, his Star Wars figurines from a little kid. And caked in the uniform is sediment from that flood still to this day, 40 years later. That's, a pic, that's an actual picture of it. So being flooded is seriously traumatic. So never doubt for a second how important our work is. We get to prevent trauma and we have always worked to protect our communities from trauma to make them safer to make a flood like any other rainy day but how wonderful is it that with our modern approach to design to planning to criteria to that to all the work we do that we also get to make our communities healthier and more beautiful these are the sorts of outcomes that fill my heart with pride that i take my daughter to see on the weekend that make our community a special place, a thriving, vital place. And may the fourth be with you all. Thanks for sticking around.